Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our event today um, on Unfree Migrant Domestic Work in Arab States. I'm Locke Su, Chair of the Asian American Research Center at UC Berkeley, the sponsor for today's event. I would like to thank the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Center for Race and Gender, and Berkeley's Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative for co-sponsoring this event with us. The format for today's event is that uh, Professor uh, Perenius will start us off with a brief overview of the book, Unfree, Migrant Domestic Work in Arab States. Then we'll hear from two discussants, Leslie Selzinger and Rachel Sylvie, who will each share about 10 minutes of remarks on the book. Then I'll give Rasel a chance to um, respond to the uh, remarks. And then we will open it up for Q&A to um, the audience. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. Um, I, will, I will have um, some time to um, ask those questions on your behalf at the end of that discussion. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Rissel Perenius, um, who is a professor of sociology and gender studies at uh, the University of Southern California. Her areas of research include labor, gender, international migration and human trafficking, the family and economic sociology. She's an ethnographer who has conducted field work in a number of places, Denmark, Italy, Japan, Philippines, Singapore, and the United Arab Emirates, as well as in the United States. It's a delight to have her here today to discuss her latest book, Unfree Migrant Domestic Work in Arab States. I also, um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that Rosal Perinas has been a long, long-term friend who is, I've known her for decades since we were undergraduates here at UC Berkeley. And it's really, truly a pleasure to see her work um, grow in such dynamic ways. Um, and so this is, this is really a wonderful um, occasion for us to have her join us along with the two discussants. Rosal Perinas. Please, you have the stage. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Locke, uh, Professor Sue, for um, inviting me uh, to talk about my uh, book, Unfree Migrant Domestic Work in Arab States today. And um, I really wanna thank um, Rachel Sylvie and Leslie Salzinger for agreeing to um, be discussants today. I respect their um, work uh, tremendously. And Rachel was pivotal in um, doing the research for this book. It, it, this book is really part of a larger collaboration that she and I did um, looking at domestic workers from Southeast Asia into um, the United Arab Emirates. And we produced a series of papers from that um, collaboration. And so, um, so this book, Unfree, uh, um, is about um, migrant domestic workers in the United Arab Emirates, focusing particularly um, on um, domestic workers from the Philippines to that country. And so for people familiar with my work, they know that I have uh, been looking at domestic workers from the Philippines um, for um, decades and now uh, starting first with uh, looking at their situation in Italy. So one big motivation of why I wanted to do this book was because while many people have since, you know, I wrote Servants of Globalization and it was published in 2001. Since then, there have been so many other studies on migrant domestic workers um, from the Philippines. And yet um, none of them focus on um, the geographic area that I'm looking at, which is, you know, the um, Gulf uh, region, Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, it's a Gulf Cooperation Council country. Um, and so I thought that was uh, actually like curious because the vast majority of migrant domestic workers end up in that region of the world. Yet we don't know much about their situation. And what we do know often comes from um, people who write about um, their subjugation, their trafficking. And so um, prior to this book, I think pretty much anything written about domestic workers in that region just um, automatically linked their position to human trafficking. And they did this because um, they really foregrounded um, the kafala system. And that's a system in which um, migrant workers in general, but domestic workers in particular now, are bound to their employers. And as workers who are bound to their employers, 
um, they cannot quit their job without their employer's permission. And um, while they are working for that employer, they have to live with them and they can only work for them. And so many people, uh, many other scholars have uh, basically foregrounded this structural legal status and uh, concluded that um, they, um, that the employers who manage domestic workers in such a system can only do one thing, which is they can only like pretty much maximize the work of these people that are under their power. Um, and so, but I, based on my empirical research, I found that that argument, which is so prevalent and pervasive, is actually does not actually does not apply to all households in that region. And that while there are some households that truly maximize the work of their domestic workers and, um, and subjugate them. Uh, and I talk about that in one of the chapters of the book, like, you know, and so they, they physically beat them, they don't feed them adequately, um, they, you know, really mistreat them, don't give them adequate accommodations. We cannot say that um, for the vast majority of employers in that region. But what is challenging is that it's challenging not to foreground that because once you hear a story of such extreme exploitation, it's hard to it, think about other situations. So for me, um, the challenge then was to be able to step back um, and put the extreme stories that I did write about in this book in a larger context that was more mindful of the um, differences in experiences of domestic workers in that region. So um, in this book then, um, in th so this book I should could say just revisits the kafala system. It offers a different conclusion than other studies. What it concludes is that the kafala does not necessarily lead to like the subjugation of domestic workers, but what it does lead to is that it leads to the absence of labor standards. And so I, I want to make a distinction there. I don't want to say that it was like, it's, it's not so much diverse labor standards, which I could easily say, uh, which I could say as well, but I wanted to sort of frame it more as not a diversity, but it's more about absence. And that absence of labor standards is what renders migrant domestic workers vulnerable then to abuse. And so um, in this book then, um, I try, so empirically what this book keeps on trying to show is that there is an absence of labor standards for migrant domestic workers, which basically means that when you enter a household, you really don't know what kind of situation you're gonna enter. So you can imagine that vulnerability that you face, right? As a worker where you're suddenly like, so it's not so much diversity you're gonna face, but it's like this, you don't really know what you're gonna confront. And um, so there's, what I found was that there's three types of households, um, or three types of um, cultures of domestic work in the region. And so there are households that dehumanize domestic workers. There's households that infantilize domestic workers. And then there, is, there are households that recognize the humanity of domestic workers. And so I primarily showed this um, variance in two ways. One, I show it through the day off. Uh, so there's domestic workers without a day off at all. There's domestic workers who are infantilized because they can leave the house, but only with a chaperone. And then there's domestic workers like with a day off, like that they can leave, you know, and they have the whole weekends, their whole weekend off, for example. And then I also talk about it in terms of food. Um, there's domestic workers who uh, don't eat. Uh, they only eat one meal a day. So you actually have these kind of cruel employers who really, you know, um, starve them. And then you have employers who are infantilize them by not ever recognizing their position as an adult with their own desires and tastes, palates, preference for food. Instead, they just feed them whatever is there without asking them what they want. It's kind of like, so they treat them like childlike, right? And then the third are employers who basically know the domestic worker likes their own food and will make those foods available for them. And so if you visit Dubai, for example, and you go to any um, supermarket in a wealthier neighborhood, you will find that um, there's always like an aisle 
with Filipino and Indonesian food there, more Filipino than Indonesian. It would be like three quarters Filipino, one quarter Indonesia. But you know that says basically that it, so it's not wealthy Filipinos who are living there eating this food. But you see that in these neighborhoods where families are likely to employ domestic workers, you have a, um, they have a mar they know that there is a market for a demand for such food, right? Um, so um, then a big part of the book then, so I didn't want this book to be just like this empirical um, narrative telling you that there was this absence of labor standard. Um, so a huge part of the book, the beginning part of the book is really about, well, what does this mean that there's no standard of employment, right? And so this is when I get into these um, questions of freedom in the book. Um, where um, I, to understand what was really going on in this region of the world, I had to really read a lot about um, freedom and what is freedom. And um, many uh, employers themselves, many uh, like the UAE government believe uh, they're the ones who would abide in what's like called a positive um, notion or uh, of freedom, like positive liberal freedom uh, that really abides by John Christman's work, where basically it's like these domestic workers are here because their lives are horrible in the Philippines. And so whatever kind of situation that they can find themselves in here can't be all that bad, right? And so this kind of notion of freedom is um, like in the work of Saba Mahmoud, for example. Um, it's also in my work in illicit flirtation, but I felt that that wasn't really like showing what's going on here. And also um, a negative liberal freedom is also not really something that um, didn't really apply here. Uh, and so a neg negative liberal freedom is basically this notion of freedom like where I can't quit my job, therefore I am oppressed and I'm unfree. So that uh, definition of freedom also does not apply to the situation because it does not account for the fact that there are variances in experiences of those who cannot leave their job. So how do we explain that? And so um, I was really happy to find that the, the work of Philip Pettit existed. And so I really build from Philip Pettit's um, discussion of Republican freedom, which he says is really kind of um, a tradition that comes from Plato. So it's always been around. And so this notion of freedom is looking basically at freedom as um, being uh, vulnerable to um, like, um, it, it's basically, it's not so much that you can't do what you wanna do, right? Because that's sort of a lawless society and that's like what negative freedom people advocate for. But it's more like being um, vulnerable to subjugation. And so these people we have to see are unfree because they're vulnerable to being subjugated. And so as advocates, what we need to do is how do we then minimize their subjugation, right? And so we cannot only rely on the law and say we should have all these laws then to protect them because laws, um, as I try to show in the book, does not always like, you can have the laws but employers will not necessarily abide by them. And so then this is when I sort of turn to economic sociology and talk about how it's morals that shape how employers behave in these households. And therefore it's morals could also be a tool that we could use to mitigate the subjugation and the vulnerability to abuse of migrant domestic workers in um, that region of the world. And so um, I just wanna conclude that um, there was a lot of things that I was intellectually and empirically trying to achieve in this book. Um, and so intellectually, it's really pushing for rethinking how we define freedom, especially for people who are uh, huge uh, anti-trafficking advocates. They have to really um, be conscious of the implicit assumptions they have about what is freedom when they fight trafficking. Um, and so a lot of them, I will note, are uh, negative freedom um, advocates. And I'm one that's trying to show in this book that negative freedom um, advocacy is really limited in what it can accomplish. And um, something I also try to accomplish in this book is to put together um, a discussion between economic sociology and labor studies. And I do this by really pushing for um, looking at morals as a tool of um, empowerment um, for uh, migrant uh, domestic workers or for laborers in general. So um, let me end there.
Thank you so much, um, Russell Perenius, for that very brief but very rich discussion, you know, of uh, the project itself and the aims of the book. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn to um, Leslie Sausinger, who is the Associate Professor in Gender and Women's Studies Department here at, um, Cal at, U at UC Berkeley. She writes and teaches on gender, capitalism, nationality, and race, and their ongoing co-formations. Her primary research questions and um, questions address the cultural constitution of economic processes and the creation of subjects within political economies. Welcome, Professor Salzinger. Thank you so much. I I want to start for to you know just thank the um, Locke and and also actually Deborah Lustig for just organizing this whole thing and Russell for just just such a really really great book. Um, I just, I, I, well, I want to start by telling people it's really a book worth reading. Um, I learned so much from, from reading the book and I, I want to make, I want to talk about three things. I don't have much time, so I'll just touch on them. Um, hopefully it will whet everybody's appetite for the book itself. I want to talk a little bit about the research, a little bit about this concept of freedom and the notion, how important certain kinds of empirical specificity are to big theoretical ideas. And then I have some questions about gender, unsurprisingly. Um, so I, Rosal, you were saying that, um, you know, this isn't merely sort of an empirical description. It's also a theoretical discussion that is obviously true, but I cannot, I just want to start by saying how impressive and amazing the research is. So the, the book, involves talking to, I think it was 84 um, domestic workers, but also, a, I can't remember, a few dozen employers, ethnographic work, watching the training of domestic workers, interviews and, um, and sort of document reading institutionally in both um, the Philippines and the, and the Emirates to, to see how this whole, how these things are structured. And I, you really get, and the work also works over time. So it works over time, it works over space. And the, the richness that you get from really seeing things from all those dimensions is really impressive. And I was especially absolutely inspired since one of the, the main issues for these workers is whether they get time off, then, Rissell was trying to make sure she didn't oversample people who had a day off since those are the easiest people, the easiest domestic workers obviously to access. People don't have a day off, it's hard to access them. And so she like found them in supermarkets and dog walking and sort of shadowed them and walked along with them and talked to them that way. I mean, that kind of research is just so invaluable. So I just want to start by saying how um, important I think that is and, and what a kind of three dimensional view that gives us. Um, and the merit of that, I think, is that it moves away, and this goes to my, my second point, that it moves us away from a kind of large ideological claim that says, this is slavery, this is trafficking, and instead insists that we think about the actual ways that these jobs work out. And uh, I, I think that one of the things that's very impressive about this book is the way in which it refuses to um, sort of romanticize and condemn what's happening, but instead actually talks about the, the actual experiences of people's labor. And in particular, um, the language that Russell uses of unfreedom is one that pushes us to really look at the experience of people who she's studying. And in particular, I think the most important thing here is the way she thinks about um, unfreedom as being a situation that can happen because you are in a situation of a certain kind of servitude, which obviously these workers are because of the Kafala system, which luckily she has just explained to you, but this 
situation where once you start working for, once you come, you're, you're, you can only work for this single employer, you can't leave. So obviously this kind of indentured situation is a kind of classic lack of freedom. But we would be remiss if we then said, well, if you got rid of that, then you would be free to work however you want because workers who flee those situations are then criminalized within the UAE and can't work legally. And therefore they are then working again in a highly oppressive situation, which is free. In other words, nobody can tell them what they're doing, but obviously that's a freedom in which they are subject to being picked up and deported and so on. And more generally still, the unfreedom of the original poverty that sent them here is something which frames the entire situation. So there's a sense in which the, the, the study is framed by this fundamental claim that the choices that people have, not just to be free from a kind of external um, subjugation, but also the choices people have to make a livable life is what's really at issue here. And in the context of the choice to make a livable life, those choices are framed by a transnational system in which the Philippines is a poor country, which has, you know, which doesn't have the capacity to um, create decent work for everybody there. And in which some people within the context of the Philippines have, are more or less elite themselves. And these people, these women, because these are mostly women, who are doing this work are very, very poor and don't have the freedom, the option to make another set of decisions. They actually have to figure out a way to um, feed their families, to educate their children. And within that context, to spend all our time saying it is a terrible form of unfreedom that they are in these oppressive work situations is to sort of willfully ignore the larger context in which, um, you know, as Isaiah Berlin said, the rich and poor alike can sleep under bridges, right? That you have to pay attention to the larger framework within which these workers are making these decisions. One um, thing I thought about this that was interesting to me is um, in the beginning of the book, you talk about how a Marxist framework sort of tends not to recognize this distinction. And there I, 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 I sort of, I think that's not quite fair. Um, to me, the Marxist claim precisely is that there are different forms of freedom and unfreedom. And the freedom of a wage worker is unfree in certain ways and free in others. And so in a sense, the requirement that we nuance the idea of freedom is precisely at the root in a certain sense of a, of a certain kind of concept of Marxist alienation. So I don't actually think that your, your work is so at odds with that. I do agree that it is very much at odds with a kind of structural claim that once you see the once you see a framework in which people are not allowed to leave, then you've finished your story. And I think the argument that you're making, which goes back to this claim, the research that I was talking about to begin with, the sort of fundamental claim that you're making, that it actually matters how it works. And that that means you need first to think um, seriously about the framework within which people are making these decisions. And second, you need to think about the actual interactions between workers and employers and how that unfolds in empirical reality in order to then talk about the um, actual experience of freedom or unfreedom and more fundamentally, what one wants to do about it. So the consequences of this are not just um, consequences for how we think about this, but they're profoundly important for the politics. Like what, what are we to do in a world in which people have different levels of freedom and which one wants to intervene in context which, in which the workers that you're describing are subject at all times 
to potential erosions of their freedom. So then what does it mean? How does one actually intervene in that in a way that isn't merely rhetorical, but that is actually effective in changing um, their experiences? So that's, I guess, both a comment and a question, which I'd just love to hear you talk about that more. And then the last thing I want to talk about is that I wanted to ask you to just reflect a little bit on the question of gender. Um, one thing that struck me is that um, you said that in, um, in many, I, it wasn't clear to me if this was happening in the UAE at this point or not, but in many of the Arab states, they've begun to um, reform the institution of kafala so that, um, so that certain jobs, um, workers are no longer bonded in the same way. But that that is not the case for domestic workers. And this, of course, immediately raises the entire question of gender. So um, one thing that you didn't talk about in your introductory remarks, so I should just say something about it here, is that, and this is something I didn't know about before, that the kafala system makes the employer responsible for the behavior of the domestic worker, which is in and of itself just absolutely fascinating to me as something I really knew nothing about. And that means that not only is the employee obligated to the employer in a variety of ways, but insofar as the domestic worker does something criminal, the employer is responsible. And within the framework of what counts as criminal is um, sexual activity that's not within marriage or getting pregnant. And what this means is that the, that sort of for, from the point of view of the employer, controlling the intimate activity of the worker is part of the package of hiring somebody. And in that sense, the, the domestic workers within the legal framework of kafala don't have sort of full independent personhood. They're more like children. They're not understood as people who have the right to certain kinds of basic forms of self-determination, especially around sexual activity. And it just me, I just want to hear you talk about gender. I mean, the book is, it's interesting to me that although you're talking mostly about women, and it's obviously a feminized occupation, you obviously know that, but you're not bringing that in as an explicit lens in your discussion. And yet it does seem like the, this entire framework, the way it works is in part structured in and through the way in which reproductive labor is done by women. Women are understood as certain kinds of people who are not sort of um, full free, adult citizens with the rights to their own bodies and their own self decisions in a much more general kind of way. And to me, that's a really incredibly interesting part of this discussion. It isn't something which is um, specific to this context, but it does. it is part of the larger framing in the same sense that um, the sort of larger experience of global inequality and um, and poverty is part of the kind of general framing. And so I'd really, really be interested in hearing you discuss further how you would sort of bring that in more explicitly to your discussion. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, it's, these are wonderful remarks and all very expansive um, questions to ask. Um, I'm pleased to welcome our second discussant, um, Rachel Sylvie, who is the Richard Charles Lee Director of the Asian Institute and Professor in the Department of Geography and Planning um, at the University of Toronto. Um, Professor Sylvie has, has uh, published widely in the fields of migration studies, cultural and political geography, gender studies, and critical development. Her research has focused on um, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Saudi Arabia, as well as um, Southeast Asian Americans. Welcome, Professor Sylvie. Thanks so much, Locke, and thank you to the organizers, Deborah Lustig and Max, for bringing us all together. A, a huge thanks to Rossel Parañas for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I've been excited about this, 
And it was wonderful to hear uh, Professor Salzing Salzinger's comments just now as well. So um, this book is extraordinary. And I really want to keep my comments to the to time. So I've I have like Leslie, I have chosen three main contributions of the book. But before I tell you those, I do want to say it's just been an extraordinary privilege to get to work with Professor Paranyas doing field work, thinking about the proposal, watching how she masterfully trains students in field work and mentors them and supports them and shows them how to do, very much echoing Leslie's earlier comments, that this, this field work is so rich, the process of the work is so well done with such attention to detail. And that comes through in the book and it, it came through, um, I got to see it firsthand um, during the field work and during the project that I got to be a part of because I was doing a similar project and a related um, conjoined project looking at the Indonesian women who are the counterparts to the Filipinos in her book, in her books. Um, so there's a lot more I could say about that, but I just want to say it's been an incredible learning experience for me. And I've seen the students and her work just shine through the whole process. Um, so, and I think that actually is worth just saying one more thing about um, before I get into the three contributions, and that is this book is really part of an oeuvre of research that has come from Professor Paranyas and that has always placed that attention to empirical detail and taking the stories of people seriously front and center and then pushed it to engage with theory and multiple different theoretical frameworks, always in conversation with one another too. So the gender questions are always there, the question. Uh, and this one, the three main contributions of this book are um, how we understand freedom and unfreedom. And it couldn't be a more timely topic um, with the rise of neo-right extremist movements all over the world. Um, that kind of freedom is not what this book is about, nor is this book preoccupied with either liberal or Marxian conceptions of freedom, both of which I found very nicely and thoughtfully reviewed in the beginning of the book. To the contrary, Unfree is really about finding conceptualizations of freedom, in this case, Republican freedom with the lowercase r, that help analyze the mechanisms that mitigate and work against the unfreedom to which domestic workers are exposed. And that's a quote. This notion of freedom that gets developed in the book really foregrounds, quote, foregrounds social societal membership over individualism and sees freedom as something that is achieved through non-domination. This conception of freedom sees as its goal the reduction of the arbitrary authority of employers. So it asks, what does this freedom look like? How is it experienced? And how can it be addressed? That's all from page seven. Um, and what it does then is it refuses to fall into the twin traps of saying that freedom is either a universal and can be defined as such, or that freedom only has particularistic exceptional meanings in given times and places. So in doing that, what, it, what the book manages to do is unhinge migration studies from some of the trappings of liberalism. Specifically, it unhinges it from the hubris of universalism and meta theory. And it also, and this to me is the especially difficult thing and, and laudatory contribution of the book, is it unhinges the notion, that notion of freedom as belonging to one place or one person and being disentangled from that of other people in other places. So it says all relations are, all freedom is relational. My phone is ringing. So, <clears throat> so it's a profoundly relational conception of freedom that the book puts forward as aspirational. 
And in so doing, it really offers not only clue, clues to improve laws, policies, and research on domestic workers, but it gives us a chance to think about the ethics of all employment relations and the agency, constrained as it always is, of workers themselves in those encounters. Who's the good boss? Who's the bad boss? How do you navigate them? How do you manage a more protective legal system as a worker or a less regulated system of labor? So workers' rights and norms are always at stake in this book and in the analysis, but they're also always, and they're also always shown to be socially mediated relations, which means there's always room for maneuver, which is, brings me to the second contribution of the book. It really emphasizes the moral and social mediation of domestic work. Um, so what this mediation emphasis does is it challenges the economic determinism that is at the forefront of so much migration scholarship and so much um, economic work as well. Um, and it says, let's take an analytical step back from the concept of morality to ask how different moral norms and codes take on meaning for different people, how they get mobilized, and how we can refuse a predetermined normativity without losing touch with the political stakes of what we're talking about. So the social, it really looks at the social life of moralities as part of what organizes structures and mediates the labor conditions that migrant domestic workers confront. And the great examples in this book of that, there are many, but two of them are the minimum wage struggle and the day off campaigns. So then the third big contribution is really the one that um, comes from my own disciplinary background. And that is, um, I think it's a real contribution to rethinking the geographies of migrant domestic workers' rights. And here, I, I think it's the different scales of analysis. So back to Leslie's point that it gives you this 360 degree understanding of the context and the struggles and the very located personal experiences of people. From a geography perspective, what that means is it's looking at multiple scales of analysis. So it really gives you a strong sense of the global macro um, political economy and the dynamics between states. And then it shows you these more mesoscale interstate relations, the sending state and the receiving state. I think they're powerful uh, examples of that in both chapters one and two. And then it also finally offers you this, and, and throughout offers you this fine grained, intimate portraits of people's struggles and their responses and negotiations and the ways that they're mediating these broader scales of analysis. So in those three ways, if I haven't gone over time, um, I think this book is really an extraordinary contribution to migration studies and in many other fields as well, um, because both liberal and Marxian frameworks to varying degrees explicitly or implicitly continue to underpin the majority of the research that comes out. And th there's not enough research that empirically questions and returns to those theories and finds the limits of them and pushes them from such a rich, grounded ethnographic perspective. So I'd like to congratulate you on this extraordinary book and thank you again for inviting me to this conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Sylvie. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Rasal uh, Pr uh, for now for to respond um, to these two very rich um, discussions, you know, of her yeah. book, and I think they've raised a number of questions. If you can go ahead and just go ahead uh, and respond to some of the th some of the questions that were raised, that'd be great. Yeah, no, yeah. Thank you so much for those comments, um, and um, thank you for um, generally liking the book. <laughs> and so um, God, that was um, so this book was really hard to write, and so first. Let me say a little bit about like freedom and um, yes, like I think um, I could have spent um, like in terms of like how I uh, 
talked about other notions of freedom like Marx or even liberal notions of freedom, I could have definitely spent more time uh, doing that and recognized nuances. But obviously that would be like a lot more challenging. Um, and um, one thing I, so, um, so Leslie is definitely correct in terms of that there's like more nuance in terms of how Marx saw freedom. But unfortunately, however, within the literature of domestic work itself and how they read it, and how they apply it. Um, I think it's how I described the way. So it, So I do want to clarify that I'm not saying, oh, like the intro is not saying this is what these, this is this kind of freedom, that kind of freedom. I mean, I tried to kind of do that, but it's so hard. But instead what I did was like, what have other people said about domestic workers in the region? And what are their implicit assumptions of freedom that are embedded in their analysis. And that's how, like, so that's why it's a little bit more simple. I think even the liberal freedom people will get mad at me that um, I didn't engage them as well, but they should be like upset with the actual scholars that use their work, you know, that use that work. Um, so that's one thing I'll say. Um, and so that's something actually that's also disappointing because so a lot of people like write about the domestic workers in the Middle East and then they make a lot of claims about freedom or just their subjugation. But there's there's a lot of bias in their analysis that they're not like um, that I'm basically trying to foreground in, in the book is what I'm doing. Um, and so to be honest with you, that's why um, I was scared for domestic workers scholars to read this book because I don't think they will be happy with my conclusions. Uh, so I'll just say that, especially in the beginning part in which I'm very critical of the reading of freedom. And then in terms of gender, you're totally right that I don't analyze gender in this book. Um, there's zero gender analysis in this book. Um, and I felt that it was really hard to, um, um, it was so implicit in it, right? And I think it was something that I felt incapable of because gender relations in that region of the world were so different, right? Like how do I even put gender in this discussion of the day off when the women who they work for don't necessarily leave the house either, right? And so that was something that I felt was gonna go into a different totally direction. And so that's something I couldn't really even talk about that maybe some, that hopefully other scholars will, will then pursue. Um, I did sort of try to get a little bit into gender when I talked about how the Philippine manages women's migration, really building from the previous works of people like Nana Oishi and also Maria Wong and Rachel Sylvie that show how like gender is so prominent and how sending states manage men and women who leave the country. And this was very, very apparent in, um, sorry, this doorbell is ringing, very, very apparent in like the different treatment of men and women by the Philippine government. And um, yeah, so I do hope that um, in this book, um, that my discussion of freedom, like invites, like I think more sociologists to, to um, investigate this concept, right? Because it's interesting, right? In sociology, we don't necessarily theorize about freedom at all, right? But I think it's all, it's, it's definitely there in our works. We, we operate, we analyze with certain assumptions of what freedom should look like. Thank you for that, um, Rissell. Um, there are a couple of questions we have in the Q&A and, &A, and um, we do have uh, a few more minutes. So um, let me go ahead and, and read them to you. The first one is from Hernan Soto Acevedo. Um, I am a Fireball scholar at UC Berkeley researching the effects of COVID-19 on domestic work. Do you have any guidance or tips um, on doing this work. Um, I will like, I will be working with domestic workers in the San Francisco Mission District. Okay, I'm glad you're doing that work, Hernan. And um, uh, interestingly, I actually co-authored a paper with two of my PhD students that was published last year, I think, in American Behavioral Scientist on um, COVID and its effects on domestic work. And what we did for our methods is we actually uh, watched a lot of town hall meetings that uh, nonprofit organizations um, were hosting for domestic workers. And that's how we found, like that's how we analyzed what their conditions were, looking at the themes that were emerging in these town halls. So I would highly suggest that for this issue that you're trying to address, sorry, there's someone in the door, like 
to, to go to um, the nonprofit organizations first. So I'm just gonna open it. Okay. Okay, so thank you. So the second question we have is from Matthew Reynolds. Um, do Professor Perenius and the discussants think that the bias towards negative freedoms might be due to the longstanding societal stigma around domestic work? Marx described the 19th century servants as ancient domestic slaves, for instance. Um, I just, I, okay, I think that, it, so I have a bias against it, right? And so the most research on domestic work do not have a bias against it. Like they support this kind of notion of freedom. Um, but I'm actually not familiar with the ancient domestic slaves reference that you're making. So um, I'd love to hear more about it. Um, Rachel, Leslie, do you have any responses? So, um, Rasal, can you tell us a little bit about the context of working in um, their Arab states and um, oh. how was that different? Because you've done field work in so many different places. And I completely agree, you know, with both um, Rachel and Leslie about the kind of um, detail, nuance, research, the, your empirical work is just amazing, you know, in that sense of, of reaching people and gaining their trust and, and being able to um, uh, you know, gather the, uh, the conversations that you um, bring to bear, you know, for um, uh, in your research. Can you say a little bit about how um, some of the challenges that might have been posed, you know, um, yeah. working in the Middle East? So, um, so thank you for that question. And so like right now, like, I'm like, I really want to go back to the United Arab Emirates, but I'm afraid to go back because I have this book out now. And many people, after their book comes out, they're like, when they make it to the airport, they don't let them in. And then they have to like turn around and fly back again, which because it's like 20 hours away, I really don't want to risk that. And so um, I feel, however, though, even though that I know that the state watches scholars, um, I also feel that there is a certain exaggeration that goes on there. Um, there's like this sort of, it's almost like an Orientalist fear. Um, and this Orientalist fear guides how people even write about it and their experiences. And so um, I won't mention the name, but if you read the book, like you'll know who I'm talking about, but someone wrote about like um, Ethiopians, like, and um, in, in, in that region of the world. And they were like, I only interviewed six people because then I had to like go stealth and I had to hide from the government. And then I had to like, and then I, I knew that they were gonna kick me out. I'm like, I don't think, I didn't really have that experience. And so like what I did, as I talked about in the method section, like my first couple of weeks there, I went to the ministry of interior to let them know I existed because then I'm like, well, if they're gonna kick me out, like all my colleagues have written about being kicked out, then I wanna be kicked out earlier than later than like, you know what I mean, not being, like it's better to be early, then you're like, okay, I can't do the study versus later you did the study and then you couldn't finish it, right? So like nothing ever happened to me. I never kind of, you know, oh, I have to hide and stuff. So I don't really know what that discourse is about. So I feel like people should do it more, right? But I don't know if I'm um, like ignorant by saying that, you know, or naive or something like that. But it was really kind of great also doing this work with Rachel. Like, and so this is something that I would um, encourage people, I think, like especially senior scholars to do collaborative ethnographies. I think there's a lot of collaborative, like um, like quantitative work, but I find that if you do these collaborative ethnographies, like your perspective really opens and then your subject positioning and how that subject positioning can open doors or close doors becomes magnified. And that was definitely the case. Like you know, with, with Rachel, like, I was like, I loved it that she was in the Philippines with me because every time we went to a government office, they were just like, of course, there's a tall blonde woman. Like you can meet us like right away. Versus if I were alone, 
like I would probably be still knocking in the door. They still wouldn't talk to me, right? It's not correct, Rachel. So that was like, you know, so I feel that that was really um, great. Like I, yeah, it just made it like, I think a much more enriched project because Rachel was by my side as I was doing much of this field work, you know? So, yeah. Thanks. We have one um, one question, and then there's also if you want to read more on Matthew Reynolds' yeah, okay. elaboration of the question. Um, the the question by uh, Alinaya Farros is that she is doing, or they are doing rather, um, doing research on the state and global wage work. I am interested in hearing more about your discussion about the distinct ways the state governs migrant men and women. Yeah. Um. So. Um. It's great you asked that question because like Rachel Selby is like one of the leading scholars who have addressed that question and her work on like how morals um, are used as a tool of gendered governance is actually like very um, pioneering in shaping our understanding of how states are gendered. Um, and um, in addition to Rachel Silvey's like work, and so this is the work that she published around 2004, 2007. There's also the work during that time that was published by um, Nana Oishi. And Nana Oishi's work is like, has since been dated because laws have changed, but it's still very relevant. And in this book by Nana Oishi, I think Women in Motion, um, she talks about basically how there's laws that govern migrant women to leave. And she says there's no laws for migrant men to leave. So there's no minimum age for men. There's a minimum age for women. Like that was like one of the things that she um, contributes. But I'm glad that you're doing this research um, uh, because gendered governance of migration, um, I think we still need a lot more work on, on this. I think especially in the context of sending states. And one other last point I wanna make about this. So another really interesting uh, scholar looking at this is Maria Wong. And Maria Wong's work basically looks at how like in the United States, when people talk about the governance of undocumented workers, they look at it as a racialized governance. And then uh, Maria Wong's research shows, and she teaches at McGill if you wanna Google her, like what her, what her research shows is that within the context of sending states, undocumented migration is less so of a racialized government governance, but more of a gendered governance. So I think these are the three key people working on this. Um, like earlier, it would be Rachel Silvey and Nana Oishi, and then and more recently, it would be uh, Maria Wong. Thank you. Um there are a couple more questions there, but I'm afraid we're going to be running out of time. Um, maybe we can take a, the, the last question um, really briefly, if you can have just one minute to answer, um, Rosal. Um, it's about exactly where you left off, the race, race and racialization. Um, how do you address that in your book within the context of unfreedom or the yeah. work of migration scholars and domestic work? Um, yeah, so thank you for your question. So you point out another limitation of the book, like uh, w the fact that I don't really analyze gender and it's implicit in there is something that Leslie uh, raised. And then likewise, I don't really analyze uh, the racialization of um, domestic uh, workers um, in, in this book. I felt like what I really was trying to instead do was that it was hard to, to, to look at racialization because I'm always only looking at Filipinos, right? Um, but there's definitely, it's definitely rich for study. So for example, something that I noticed, noticed in the field that I couldn't have like the space or capacity to talk about in the book is the fact that there is a pan-ethnic formation. So there's a lot of allegiance between Indonesians, Nepalese and Filipinos and that pan-ethnic allegiance that has formed among domestic workers in that country is not uh, shared with like Ethiopians and Kenyans who they really did not like. So there is, from the perspective of Filipinos, a racial tension between them and Ethiopians, but there is this affinity that they have towards Nepalese and Indonesians. This is something I do not write about. This is something that was just sort of would kind of come up in the field work. And, but I also felt this was not really the question that I was pursuing in the book that, some, that I hope other scholars will. Thank you so much. Um, I want to just thank um, Rosal Perenas again for coming to speak to us on this fabulous new book, um, Unfree, 
Um, it's from Stanford University. Uh, we do have, if you look at the announcement there, I think there is even a discount code for you to get. And thank you, um, Rachel Sylvie and Leslie Sel Selzinger for um, your wonderful remarks. And of course, I wanna thank Deborah Lustig and Max, um, who's, uh, thank you so much for helping us, assisting us in this um, event. So, and thank you all of you for joining us today. Thank you, Locke. Bye. Bye. Russell.